Welcome to NOAA Live Alaska. My name is Lisa Hiruki Raring, and I'm going to be moderating today's webinar. This series is a collaborative effort by NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center, where I work, NOAA's Alaska Regional Collaboration Network, and NOAA's National Weather Service. This webinar series is designed to help you to get, get to know NOAA's work in Alaska and how we connect and work with your communities. NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, studies the ocean and the atmosphere and where the two meet from weather to ocean to the animals that live around us. All of our speakers work for some part of NOAA or work in partnership with NOAA. We hope this gives you a sneak peek at the different career paths that you might be interested in. Okay, today we're introducing you to Sean Rohan who works for NOAA Fisheries Alaska Fisheries Science Center in Seattle, Washington. While we'll be talking about NOAA's role in research and stewardship, we want to recognize that we're all coming to you from the traditional lands of Native communities who have substantial traditional and local knowledge and much to share with us. In Alaska, Sean's work is conducting in, conducted in the Bering Sea and Gulf of Alaska, from which from north to south include the traditional home waters of the Inupiat, Yupiat, Siberian Yupiat, Inungah, Alutit, Iyak, Tikit, Haida, and Simshin people. We'd also like to acknowledge that Sean is presenting from, and we're hosting this webinar from, the traditional lands of the First People of Seattle, the Duwamish people past and present. A few guidelines before I hand you over to Sean. You're all muted because we have a lot of people on the line and we want to make sure everyone can hear our speaker. However, there's a box where you can write questions. We encourage you to ask them as we go and my colleague Chris Beyer and I will be keeping track of questions for Sean behind the scenes. He'll stop every now and then and answer a few questions. We may not get to all of our questions, but we'll try to answer as many as we can. So please, when the questions um, occur to you, please put them into the question box and we'll keep track. All right, I'll hand it over to Sean to introduce himself. All right, thank you, Lisa. Um, like Lisa said, my name is Sean Rohan and I'm a, a biologist with uh, NOAA's Alaska Fisheries Science Center in Seattle. Um, and most of my research is indeed in Alaska. So just to orient people, let's see. So here's where I am in Seattle, and here's Alaska, and most of the work that I do is up here um, in the Bering Sea uh, region. And um, give you a little bit of background of how I got to actually working at NOAA. Um, so I'm from Seattle, and I grew up around the water uh, because Seattle is surrounded on two sides by water here. Um, so we have Puget Sound, which is salt water, and Lake Washington here. Um, and this is where I grew up in, in North Seattle. Um, I went to high school at Garfield High School in Seattle where I had some amazing teachers who um, sort of encouraged me to pursue this, this interest um, in marine science. Uh, I went to the University of Washington for undergrad, for, my, uh, for college. And then um, I got my start sort of working in the field, working for, for Coast as an intern, the Coastal Observation and Seabird Survey Team which uh, Veronica Padula mentioned uh, during one of the recent talks. Um, they're the beach bird program that operates sort of all along the coast of Washington and up into Alaska, Washington, Oregon, California, and up into Alaska. Um, and nowadays I work at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, which is very, very close to where I grew up. So really fortunate to have grown up in a, in a place where I could pursue this interest without actually having to leave the city. Um, so my first field experience with, with Coast was out on Tatoosh Island. Tatoosh Island is, is just, it's a bird colony. It's on, it's, um, uh, on the uh, land of the macaw and it is just an incredible place. And I sort of, the first time I went to Tatoosh, I kind of realized that this is definitely what I want to be doing for, for a career. I want to be doing science for a career. And on Tatoosh Island, um, I studied these uh, birds called leeches storm petrel and they're just this tiny ocean going bird um, and they're they return to the colony at night so they're nocturnal on the colony and um, there won't be a lot of memorization in this talk but if you want to you can commit that to memory leeches storm petrel because it will come up at the end and I will ask you about it okay so like I said um, from from Seattle work in Seattle um, at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center, but most of my research uh, is in the Bering Sea um, and up into the, the Chukchi Sea a little bit, but also out in the Aleutians and the, and the Gulf of Alaska. And so when I'm in Seattle, most of what I'm doing is just sitting in front of a computer analyzing data that we collect. 
um, in Alaska uh, during during the summers. And so during the summer, I go up to Alaska, and it is fantastic because one of the things that I really enjoy about my job is getting to go out um, into the the systems that I that I study and sort of experience them firsthand. Um, and let's see. Just get this going here. And when we're up in Alaska, the main thing that we're doing is collecting information about um, about species that are that are commercially that are harvested commercially that are that are commercially harvested um, harvested for subsistence purposes and recreation. And here are some of those species here, which is uh, walleye, pollock, Pacific cod, snow crab, tanner crab and then a red and blue king crab. And sorry, one second here, and some weird technical difficulties here. So how do you all think that we collect information about these species? We go out, um, and I'll give you a hint, it was in the title of the talk. <laughs> yeah. All right, so if you if you can think about it, think about how Sean and his colleagues might study these animals, collect information about the fish and the crab um, when they go out to sea. So we've got uh, Mitsuko is saying that you might tag them. Um, Bridget's saying that you take water temperatures. Laura is saying that you do deep sea dives. Um, and how do you think that they take information on the walleye pollock and the Pacific cod, the fish that they're looking at? Any guesses? Let's see. Um, Jaden is saying that that, that you scan the seafloor, so, so um, you could. There, that's definitely one of the things that we've been looking at. Um, Laura was saying drones, so we've got a lot of different guesses. What do you think, Sean? Yeah. So the way that we do that is uh, the way that ooh, the way that we collect information about these species is using uh, bottom trawls. So we go out on um, on commercial fishing vessels that we charter for our for our bottom trawl surveys, and we go up every summer, except for this past summer because of COVID. Um, and we collect data from the the species that we showed in that I showed in the previous slide, but also just all of the other species out there. So here's just a smattering of some of the important species that we collect information on. So Pacific Ocean perch, yellowfin sole, uh, sablefish or black cod. Um, we have people from the halibut commission come out and we collect information on halibut, uh, flathead sole, short spine thorny head, Greenland turbot, arrowtooth flounder, contractor flounder. The list goes on and on and on. Lots and lots of different species. Um, and we do that, like I said, using a bottom trawl. So a bottom trawl is a net that um, you can see here is spooled up onto this onto this reel. And we go out and we sample at a bunch of different stations. And we drop the net down to the bottom. It goes out like that. Uh, we tow it along the bottom for in the Bering Sea 30 minutes. And then we bring it back up. And when it's on the bottom, the net looks something like this. And you can sort of imagine like if I was standing in this, I'm I'm about five foot eight. Uh, I would come up to about here on the net. So it's really big in in human terms. But in preparing for this talk, I was thinking, what percentage of the total area of the Eastern Bering Sea does our bottom trawl survey actually sample? So the Eastern Bering Sea is this area here, and it's about 800,000 square kilometers. Um, and in 2019, we sampled 520 stations. So my question to you is what percentage of the total area of the Eastern Bering Sea do you think we sampled in 2019? So um, for those of you in the audience, what we're asking here is out of that whole area of the Eastern Bering Sea, that whole ocean area, um, how much do you think that we're able to survey using the boats that Sean was showing? Is it A, 3%, B, 0.3%, C, 0.003%, or D, 75%? And Bridget is saying B, 0.3%. Texas is saying B, 0.3%. Mitsuko is saying A, 3%. It looks like people are going more towards the smaller side, although Laura did say D, 75%. 
And Jaden also said D, 75%. Oh, Laura, Laura corrected herself to C, 0.003%. And Pam is uh, saying B. So most of the people it looks like are saying B, 0.3%. Okay. Well, the answer is actually C, 0.003%. So we survey a very, very, so the, the net sample is a very, very small portion of the total bearing C. Um, and to put that in perspective, um, if you imagine that this glass is the entire Eastern Bering Sea, the 800,000 square kilometer Eastern Bering Sea, then the area that we sample would be the equivalent of about two to three grains of rice, um, depending on which type of rice you used. <laughs> so yes, some rice is bigger than others. A very, 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 very small portion. And Sorry, I'm having all sorts of technical difficulties here. And, uh, oh, yes, yeah. so with that, I want to stop to take some questions if people have them. So one question that came up is, if you're only sampling such a very, very small part of the Eastern Bering Sea, how, how can you use that information to, like, what do you use the information for? Yeah, so we, that's a good question. We have to be very, very careful about how we actually design our sampling so that we're sampling a representative area of the Bering Sea. In other words, we want to sample just enough so that we can collect the information that we need to get the data that we need to manage the, the fisheries, um, to provide the information that's used to manage the fisheries. So very careful design um, is, is the answer. And then... I think that you had shown a computer screen with a bunch of numbers on it, and I think that's kind of what you use your, your data for, right? You put it into um, models that help you figure out what the population levels are. Is that right? Well, I personally don't do that, but yes, there are people who, who dedicate their, their entire lives or careers to, to doing that, yes, to, um, to developing the models that are used for, for stock assessments. Um, and yes, that's what that shows. So Bridget also had a question about the net. She said, how do the fish get caught in the net because there's no top to it? Oh, there is a, there is a top to the, well, there's no, so the, the fish, some of the fish are, they're on the bottom. So they'll swim into the path of the net and they'll get caught. Some fish will dive down into the net. Um, and essentially we, we just, because of the behavior that fishes exhibit um, when the net approaches, we're able to catch them. So what I think of is kind of like if you have an aquarium and you have a net that you're pulling through the water, that's basically what you're doing, right? You're pulling the net through the water so the fish sort of swim in and then they get caught in the, the tail end of the net. Is that what it is? Yes, so there is, and in this picture that I showed here, there is a, there is a top to it. You can, can't quite see it here because of the way this picture is, but um, there is that that top. So, but basically the fish are staying close to the bottom as the net is approaching to this bottom trawl, and they so they kind of get scooped up. Yeah, right. Um, Laura was asking, do you tag the different species? Uh, sometimes is the answer um, it, for special projects. And then. Um, and then, so what do you find out, what, what are you trying to find out from the tags? Uh, so the tagging is, is not the sort of the core of what we do, but when we do, when fish do get tagged, it's often to figure out movement patterns. So when, where, they, where they are and when, and if we tag them in one place, are they captured in another place later? And where's that place? So um, Texas had a question of how do you keep the net from damaging the seafloor? Because he saw that, that the, the, you were saying that the net gets pulled along the bottom. But I was wondering if those rollers have something to do with, with uh, what Texas's question has, is. So the net does have an impact on the bottom. Um, it disturbs the bottom. It can potentially, um, yeah, it, it, it does pick up a lot of things that are sitting on the bottom in addition to fish. Um, so the way that we mitigate our total impact on the total seafloor is we sample this very, very small area. 
And then another thing that we do is one of the things in our lab is um, we work with the fishing industry to um, make designs on nets so that, that they um, minimize the damage and also um, minimize bycatch. So those are other yeah. areas where our lab does things. Yeah, there are there are groups at our center that work on, on sort of the bycatch reduction. Like Lisa was saying, there are groups that use what are that have been working on designs of things like elevated sweeps. So the ropes that are dragging along the bottom, you can think of um, instead of being on the bottom, they, they can be raised up slightly um, to reduce the impact on the on the seafloor. And then Michelle had a question about: Do you put the fish back that you catch? Uh, I will talk about that as we when we move on here but yes we don't we don't keep anything except for the the samples that we need great well um i know that you're going to be dealing with that um in your, our next sections so maybe we can move forward and i just wanted to make one more point that um sean went through some math to figure out this 0.003 percent number so um, we're going to put a worksheet on our website so that for those of you who are interested in how Sean came about with that uh, uh, number of 0.003%, you guys can do your the math yourselves and figure it out and also check Sean's math because he wanted you guys to check it. Yes, and let me know if I'm wrong. <laughs> um, okay. So moving on, so we just towed the net along the bottom for the 30 minutes and then we brought it up. Now what? Well, we have to collect a bunch of information about the, about the fish. And I wanna know what types of information people think we would want to collect about the fish. So think about the kind of information you might want to know about fish when you catch it and um, Think about what scientists might want to find out from the fish and then type that answer into your question box. So um, one other hint might be what kind of information do you take when you go to the doctor when um, they want to check up on how you're doing? So those kinds of, of information, that's the same sorts of information that we want to find out from fish. So Michelle is saying that you might want to know how much the fish weigh and whether they're male or female. Um, yep. Texas yep. says maybe you want to know how many fish there are, how big they are, so the length maybe. Yes. Um, yep. Jaden wants to know where they, thinks that you want to know where they travel. Um, Laura is yep. saying that you might want to sample their DNA. Um, yes. Jaden also Genetics. once yep. said that the size is, is another aspect of what you want to find out. And um, Eve, oh, actually Jasper says, um, you want to know how old they are. Yeah. Yeah, all of those so, things are, I think, I think most, most or all of those things are true. So good job, everyone. Cool. Um, so here, here's just all of the information that we, that here's the information that we typically correct from, collect from fish. Um, not, we don't collect all of this information from every fish. We don't collect all of this information all the time. Um, the information that we, that we always collect are things like age, length, weight, which people mentioned, um, sex, which pe biological sex, which people have mentioned, so whether they're male or female. Um, we also collect information about sometimes maturity, um, diet, which I, didn't, I don't think we heard anyone say anything about diet, but we heard people mention genetics um, or DNA. And then sometimes information about disease. So now I'm just going to talk about some of the, the data that we collect and walk through how exactly we collect the data. So the first thing that happens when we, when we bring the catch up, if it's a big enough catch, we weigh the whole thing using this device called a load cell. It's like a scale that you hang from a crane and we'll pick up the entire catch and weigh it. So after that, if we have a big catch, we'll, we'll dump it into this bin here, and then we'll take a subsample of it, and we'll fully we'll, we'll collect all of the data from from the subsample, and then some of the things from some data from things that were not part of our subsample. So here you can see that we. Sean, when you're here. saying subsample, when you're saying subsample, is that a smaller sample from within the the part that you pulled aside? 
Yes, so a portion of the catch, so not the whole catch. Um, because we don't need to collect data from all of these fish, we just need to collect data from, from some of them, so a representative portion. So we're here we're, we're using the crane again to lift up some a portion of the catch that we're going to collect all data that we're going to collect data from um, entirely and then um, that gets moved over here to the sorting table. So here you can see that this catch is comprised is mostly pollock, um, which are all of these sort of silvery fish with the with the modeling on the backs here. Um, and depending on where you go and sort of how deep you are or where you know, how far north or south you are and the, the year, you see different things. So here this is this is kind of far south in the in the Gulf of Alaska. Um, and here we have a completely different uh, completely different types of fish. So here we have Pacific Ocean perch, which are these red um, rockfish, uh, and then we have uh, sablefish, black cod. In other areas, we might not see uh, many fish at all. So here, um, these are all purple stars and with a few fish mixed in. And then this one is uh, full of what we call uh, sea peaches and sea onions, um, which are uh, invertebrates, they're, they're tunicates. Uh, and then I think there are also a few sea potatoes in here as well, which are also tunicates. And also sea urchins, which are the, the spiny things. Um, and here's another, here's another catch, and this one's mostly crab. So this one looks to be mostly, uh, probably snow crab. So once we have that catch and it's and it's on the table, then everybody gathers around the table and sorts it into these baskets. You can see that each one of these baskets has sort of a different a different species in it. Um, and then we weigh things again. So now all of the everything that was in the baskets, we're going to weigh them to get information about the about the weight for each of the different species in the catch. And that's what this here is. This is a this is a scale. And then we're going to collect lengths. So people mentioned lengths. Yes. So what we do is we take the this is a length strip that has barcodes on it. It's like a ruler that has a barcode on it. And what you do is there's a wand um, that's connected with Bluetooth to a tablet, and you swipe it for at the the length of the fish. And here's sort of the close up of what that looks like. So we collect lots of lengths. We also collect uh, length. And uh, with carapace, with information from, from crabs, and what you do for that, this is also uh, connected to the to this tablet, to this tablet with the Bluetooth. And all this is is calipers. So use the calipers to get the width of something. Um, so the next thing that we will be collecting is is age information. So someone mentioned age, and yes, so we collect. Um, does anyone know what this is actually? So if you if you think you know what that little picture up on the right hand side of the of the screen is, um, write it into your question box. It looks it looks like Michael is saying it's an otolith. So what is an otolith ah. exactly, Sean? Yes, otolith. Good job, Michael. Yeah, so an otolith. An otolith is uh, it's the ear bones of a fish, or ear, ear bones in a, in a fish. They're sitting inside of these fluid-filled sacs. And what happens as the fish grows is that there are these rings that grow on the otolith, and you can count the rings like you would a ring on a tree to tell how old it is. So this, whatever fish this came from, I guess this would have been from a, from a rock sole. You can see the growth bands, and that looks to be seven years old. Um, so then the next thing that we collect sometimes, not actually not super often for, for fish, um, is information about disease. So here was some photos from a study looking at lamprey marks. So lampreys are, are um, these, uh, these fish that have uh, suckers that have, a, that have like um, um, a sucker on the head that has some teeth in it and it latched onto this cod and it will basically be just uh, 
sucking the, the blood out of the fish. Some other things that we might collect are our diet. Um, and here is looking at a few prey items that were inside of the stomach of a, of a walleye pollock. And would anyone like to take a guess at what these are? Um, I'll give you a hint. Uh, if you were at uh, Leah and um, Aaron's talk, or Colleen and Allie's talk, you may have already seen these. So if you think that you know what the little little creatures that are next on, on the measuring um, stick here, that, that Sean is circling with the red dot, type it in. Oh, Texas is saying that he's saying maybe it's baby crabs. Laura is saying stingrays maybe. Um, Jaden also thinks baby crabs. I think we have some pretty smart folks on the line here who remember seeing these in earlier talks. Yeah, okay, so we got a bunch of baby crab answers, right? Yes, so these are crab megalope, megalope larva, um, or a juvenile stage of crab, and they're they're smaller than, than like your pinky nail. They're really, really small. Um, so that's like a centimeter or so. They're like, they're like about this big. <laughs> okay, so that's a brief overview of the types of information that we collect on, on fish. I didn't show any pictures of genetics because we didn't have any good ones to show, but uh, um, so, take any um, questions. Laura was asking about the sea peaches, sea potatoes, and sea onions that you were talking about. They looked like little rocks, um, and you said that they're tunicates. So what, what is a tunicate exactly? So they're um, invertebrates that that are they basically suck water through their bodies to to feed. So they they often in those cases they attach to a hard to a hard object, which can be like a rock or a shell of a of a snail or um, a crab shell, um, and they have a they have a bunch of different forms, but they're they're just invertebrates that filter feed, um, a type of invertebrate that filter feeds. And Looks they have like you get a lot of different things in your catch. Um, we did have a question from Facebook. Um, Paul Peterson was wondering how much impact do you think there is each year in a, in a, that's in a new area versus areas that have been trawl fished for years? So in other words, what's the, what's the impact um, of bottom trawl surveys in new areas? You know, that's a good question. I'm not sure that I have an answer to that. Um, there are groups that are, there are folks at our center who work on trawl impacts and they would probably have a better um, understanding of those things. Uh, one thing that can affect how much of an impact trawling has is what sort of terrain you're trawling on and what sorts of things live there. So oftentimes if you're trawling in sort of softer Sub softer sediments, softer C4, it has less of an impact than if you're trawling over potentially like hard areas that have or areas with um, structural um, invertebrates growing. So Jasper had a question about whether the animals are hurt by the trawl net or survey. Um, yes, I, I think that to some extent there, you know, there are impacts. I don't think that the animals really necessarily enjoy getting caught in the trawls. Um, so that's, you know, we, we try to trawl, we try to um, have as little of an impact as we can while still collecting the amount of data that we need. And um, you had mentioned that you were looking at diet of, of fish. Um, do you do that by um, by, by looking what, at what's in the stomachs of the fish? Yes, so, we look, so there are a couple ways of doing that. One of them is to look at the, at the stomach contents. So we have an entire lab in, in, uh, in Seattle that is dedicated to looking at things that fish are eating, um, the stomach contents of fish. Um, there are other ways that you can do that. Um, not in, there are other ways of looking at diet, um, such as using uh, stable isotopes, um, 
where you're basically looking at the chemistry of different parts of the fish, like the liver um, or muscle, uh, to see sort of what they're eating over longer, often longer time periods. And uh, Michelle had wanted to know, how do you spell the growth bones in the fish ear? And so I was going to, um, I think I will put that in the chat for everybody to see. So it's, um, so the bones that Sean was talking about are otoliths, O-T-O-L-I-T-H-S, and um, they're, they're little, um, they're actually ear stones that are in the head of the fish. And that's what, um, scientists use to look at the age of the fish like Sean was talking about. Um, somebody, uh, Kevin earlier was was guessing that the otolith looked like a scale. Um, can age also be determined from scales? You can look at growth increments uh, with scales and that's often done with um, like at shorter time, over shorter time periods, like over the course of days, uh, often with juvenile fishes. So it's a common, it's often, yeah. I, I used to do some work with salmon and that's one of the things that we would look at. Great. Well, um, why don't we move to our next section? And if you guys have any other questions about the kind of data that, that Sean and his colleagues collect on these surveys, please put them into the box and we'll handle them at the next time we stop for questions. Okay. So the next type of data that we collect is, is environmental data. And I want to start with this, and we collect this during the surveys, we collect this during at the same time that we're doing these hauls. And the question that I have um, for you all is why do you think we collect information about the environment during our surveys? So for everybody in the audience, um, when Sean and his colleagues are out on their surveys, why do you think they collect the information that they do about the environment? And um, also, what do you think that they collect? Oh, we'll get we'll get to that one. Okay, sorry, Start I'm, with I'm the, getting ahead of myself. So let's take one question at a time. Why do you think they collect the information? Yeah. Okay, so Jaden is saying to more to know more about the fish. Texas is saying to, to check the health of the water to see the impact of the fisheries. Um, Laura says so the, that you know what happens down in the ocean. Michelle says determine the health of the fish. So what do you think, Sean? Oh, yeah, and Jasper so, says so that they know if things like temperature are changing. Yeah, so that's, that's a good one. So we do want to know if the environment is changing um, because the environment um, affects what sort, how fish fare in the ocean and how other animals fare in the ocean. Um, so, and it also tells us something about why we might find some one type of animal in one place and another type of animal in another place. So in the picture on the left here, had a bunch of pollock. And then in the picture on the right here, have a bunch of peaches and onions and potatoes. Um, and there might be environmental differences that lead to different types of animals being in different places and we and we, we know that and the other thing is as someone alluded to is um changing environmental conditions and ocean ocean health i think and yes so we do want to understand how the ocean conditions are changing as a whole because the ocean is part of one is just one big ecosystem and uh, we want to know how the ecosystem is changing because it affects lots of different things um, so now we'll get to this question. Um, what type of information do you think we collect about the environment? Okay, so what kind of information do you, so some some of you guys have, had talked already about temperature. I think Jasper had talked about temperature, but what kind of other information do you think are is collected on um, these surveys? Laura is saying the condition of the water. Michelle is saying salinity. salinity. Um, Texas is saying pH. Kevin also said pH. Pam is saying whether the water is acidic. So that would be ocean acidification, I would think. And so we have a lot of temperature and salinity 
condition of the water maybe is like water quality, um, clarity, water clarity. Mm. So what do you think, Sean? Yeah, so those are all good guesses and lots of things that, you know, some, some of the things we do collect, other things we, we hope to eventually collect. Um, but some of the main things that we collect here are, um, like people were mentioning, salinity temperature. Uh, we collect that using a conductivity temperature depth unit that gets attached to the net. Um, and it goes down and it samples the water uh, while it's going down and then again and while it's on bottom and then when it's coming up. Um, we also collect information about light and we can use the information about light to get to information to understand um, uh, changes in water clarity. If I think if that's what people were um, alluding to. And over time, because we, we basically go out and we do these surveys at the same time every year or every other year, depending on the region, um, we start to see how the ecosystem is changing over time, how environmental, how the environment is changing over time. Um, and here I just want to let's see. So here I'm going to show um, an animation of ocean temperature from 2000 to 2019, and this is ocean bottom temperature. And as this animation happens, I just want to know what folks see. What do they What do they notice is happening um, with the bottom temperatures over the over the years? So this is in the Bering Sea. So, and just so that that everybody is aware, the blue temperatures are colder, yes. and the red, and as you go through green to yellow to red, it's getting warmer and warmer. So, what did you guys see in that cool. video? As Sean plays it one more time, what are you guys seeing in in changes from year to year with the with um, the temperature? Michelle is saying that she thinks that it's getting warmer. Um, Laura saying that it looks like climate change with the water warming up. I'm seeing that some some years seem to be warm and others seem to be colder. And there yeah. are some years where there's a lot of blue. Yeah, so there is a lot of, it does change a lot year to year. In some years, it is really cold. There's blue and purple that comes over a large, most of the most of the Bering Sea in this area. And in other years, it's very, very warm. Um, especially in, in some recent years, it has been very, very warm. And that's largely because there hasn't been a lot of sea ice in, in that area, in the northern Bering Sea in, in recent years. Um, and sort of by collecting this information over time, we can see how the ecosystem is changing. And yes, we could, we can examine how those conditions are changing, how the temperatures are changing um, in relation to um, climate change, uh, the things that happen because of climate change, such as loss of sea ice and, and warming ocean temperatures. And also by collecting that information at the same time as we're collecting information about the fish, we get to we can understand or have better understanding of how um, climate change and how climate vari how variation in or differences in, in water temperature among years might be affecting fish distributions. Um, and here are two species that are that are pretty common in the in the Bering Sea and um, Chukchi Sea. Uh, Arctic cod and juvenile walleye pollock. And to the untrained eye, these look very, very similar, but these are actually quite different in terms of the types of, in terms of the temperatures they like. So Arctic cod likes really cold temperatures. Juvenile walleye pollock likes what I would consider cold temperatures, but are much, 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 well, quite a bit warmer than what the Arctic cod uh, like. Um, and in recent years, we have seen more uh, adult walleye pollock, um, this is an adult walleye pollock, uh, in the northern part of our survey area. 
Um, so looking at these two fish, uh, so this is a, the approximate size of these two, two fishes. Um, these two fish uh, are both, would both be adults if they're around this size. So um, you can see that there are very, even though they're, they look very similar when they're small, eventually they look quite a bit different and they're very different uh, uh, ecologically as they grow and also younger. So the other types of information that we might collect, um, we might collect information about the, the prey that's out there for the fish because prey, um, the amount of food that's available for the fish can affect how well they grow. So here's one way that we can do that, that we've done that um, using, uh, this is a sediment grab and what this does is it drops down to the bottom and it has the, it, has this shovel apparatus that closes and picks up some, some of the seafloor. Um, then you bring it up to the surface and it looks something like this. You wash it down uh, with, a, with a sieve. You end up with a much, much, much smaller amount of um, uh, sediment and, and little critters that are living in there. And then they get sent back to the lab in Seattle. You look at them under the microscope and you see an entire world down there. So um, here's a here's an amphipod, um, which is about the like smaller than the size of my pinky nail again. Um, here's a little worm that's uh, sort of about the size of the tip of my finger there, um, and then this right here is a is a snail called Solariella, and when you look at it under the you look at it under the microscope, it looks kind of like a like an opal, like opalescent. It has all sorts of rainbow rainbow colors on the shell. And yeah, so we look at that in relation to um, where the fish are and what they're eating and what the temperatures are, and that helps us understand um, growth, how the growth conditions differ in, in um, across the the Bering Sea. And so, yeah, I'll take any questions about our environmental data collection. All right. So um, one question I had actually that went back to your, you were talking about um, the CTD, conductivity, temperature, and depth. So is the reason why you're looking at depth because the um, salinity and the temperature are different at different depths? Is it different at the surface versus at at deeper temperatures or deeper depths? Yeah, so it can be. In some places, it's it's the same throughout the water column. In other places, it, it changes. In some cases, it's it's warm, and it's in some cases it's warm near the surface and colder near bottom. So the in the maps that I showed, um, you can see that was bottom temperature on the surface. It would be it would generally be warmer. Um, and yes, so, uh, salinity can also change or how salty it is can also change uh, with depth. So even though the whole ocean is, even though, um, you know, the whole ocean is salty as a whole, it's not as salty in some places as others. So for example, if you're um, along the coast where there are rivers coming in, like it's a lot fresher. Great. So we had a couple of questions about this slide with all of the fish on it. Um, uh, Laura was asking, what kind of fish are those? On the slide, these ones. Yes. Uh, these are uh, bearing flounder. Are they all the same species? I think they are. It's hard to it's hard to see the mouths here. I think these are all bearing flounder. These ones all are all the ones where I can actually see the mouths. So these are all bearing flounder. I think these are all bearing flounder. Oh, so you identify them by what kind of mouth they have. That's one of the things that we use. It's also the, the color, the tail shape. Um, you can see these have like a, um, the, the body shape. Uh, there are lots of different things that we, lots of different uh, characteristics that we have to use to identify the, the fish. Great. So Pam was actually asking also about these fish. Why do their colors change? So the yeah, little so ones are really clear. Yeah, so that's a that's a good question, um, and it 
probably has to do with uh, the as as you get larger and as you sort of have some of these organs, like it, it, you can't just continue to be transparent essentially. So they start to develop pigments and the pigments are often sort of like a, are, are a camouflage. Um, so they might blend in really well with the, with whatever the seafloor looks like where they live. Um, because when they're smaller, yeah. they, they tend to start more translucent. Often because That's they're- very neat. Yeah. Um, Laura was asking how big are the bigger ones? Uh, so in this picture, the biggest one is probably about the size of my hand or like a, like a phone. <laughs> <laughs> do so they get a big. lot bigger than that bearing flounder yeah they get they get like this or so maybe a little bit bigger cool um so kevin was saying that water temperature affects dissolved oxygen levels too is that right um and so he was saying that does this affect the harmful presence of like diseases and you know things that that cause diseases? Yes. So Kevin is correct that temperature and dissolve and oxygen levels are are related. So when you have uh, higher temperatures and generally it's it's less oxygen. Um, and that's just chemistry. Um, the, the, how, the, how the chemical properties of, of water work. Um, when it comes to disease, it kind of depends on uh, what, on whether or not the temperatures are changing in the way that causes stress. So in general, if you have, if you're under a lot of stress, you are more vulnerable to, to disease. So if, if it gets uncomfortably warm for fish, you might expect to see more disease, yes. And then one last question before we move on to your last section. Laura was asking, how do the animals adapt to, to the sudden to sudden changes? So, like you were looking, we were looking at the bottom temperatures and how they shifted so much from year to year. And you might be you might be talking about this uh, a little bit more, but um, she wanted to know how animals adapt to those environmental changes. Yeah, I don't think I'm going to talk about that more, but uh, I can talk about that now. So it kind of depends on whether or not you can move. Um, if you can move, then you just move and take advantage of, of the conditions that are favorable for you. If you can't move, um, then you just kind of have to deal with it, uh, which means that you might be under a lot of stress. Uh, you could potentially die. Um, and um, yeah, you might just, you won't be doing so well. If you move, you might have to move a longer distance, though. You would okay. um, well, I think that's all of our questions for now. And if there are any other questions, please type them in. And if you want to go to your next section, Sean, I think we have about 12 minutes left. OK. So the next part that I want to talk about is just why do I like going to sea? What's the thing that keeps me coming back? And I think it comes back to just not really knowing what it is that I'm going to see. Um, wake up every morning at sea, knowing that I'm gonna be working pretty hard, moving around a lot of fish, doing a lot of physical labor, collecting collecting the data. But I don't, I really don't know exactly what I'm gonna see. Um, and, you know, one of the more exciting things to me was the first time I saw a short-tailed albatross. Um, so this is a short-tailed albatross right here in the middle. Um, up here are some northern fulmars, both a light and a dark morph. So even though they look different, they're the same species. Um, but short-tailed albatrosses are, are kind of fascinating to me because they're these uh, large oceanic birds that were nearly hunted to extinction um, uh, by the middle of the 20th century, so around the, the 1950s. Um, and there were less than, I think, 25 left in the, in the world. Um, and they all were inhabiting this, they're all nesting on this volcanic island off the coast of Japan over here um, called Torishima. So they've made a pretty remarkable recovery. And now you see them up here in the, out here in the Bering Sea. And this is about 3,000 plus miles or so. Um, and it's just kind of remarkable to think 
about how close those birds came to extinction and now we, we see them somewhat regularly. Um, and that's just really exciting to me the first time I saw one of those. Um, we also see lots and lots of other life that comes up in the net and sometimes like even though I've been out there for for 10 years at this point, um, going out for 10 years at this point, there's still things that I just don't for the I've never seen before. I don't know what they are. Um, and we're fortunate to have like to have uh, taxonomists and system systematists to study genetics um, who identify all of the things who were able to identify all the things and then write these guides that we use to identify things. Um, and no matter how long you've been going out, you're still going to just forget some things and um, have to figure those things out. So it's not just about memorization. It's about understanding how to identify things. And you just never really know what you're going to see. So up here on the, on the top right is a, is a snail shell, an empty snail shell. And it has some, some worm uh, casings growing on it here. It has a barnacle growing on it here. And then some fish eggs on the inside of the, of the snail shell. On the bottom right here is uh, an amphipod. It's a little shrimp-like crustacean. And this is a species that, that broods its young. So all of these little amphipods are, are hanging off of mama's belly over here until they're old enough to go off on their own. Um, and that's just really fascinating to, to see those sorts of things. And then, uh, let's see, what do, you, what do folks think this is? So this is, I'll give you, a, I'll let you know that this is a sponge, the yellow thing, but what are all of the, what are all of these things sticking out of the sponge? So if you have a guess on what you think the things that are sticking out of the little holes in the sponge are, um, go ahead and type them in. Bridget is saying that worms, Kevin is saying polychaete worms, Texas and Laura also say worms. Any other guesses? I think most people are saying worms. Yeah, it does look a lot like worms, doesn't it? Oh, Pam but, said lamprey. <laughs> ah. Well, so I will say there is a there's a little worm um, shell right there, but what this actually is is brittle stars. So this is a sponge, and there are just all of these brittle stars crawling inside of the sponge, and it's just the weirdest looking thing when you just see like the sponge come up and just these arms like sticking out and moving. Um, and we see, you know, we see all sorts of different stars. So here's just a, a handful of the types of stars we see. These ones, they look, they have different colors, but these are the same. I think these are the same species. Um, they all fit inside the palm of your hand. This is one of my favorite hermit crabs here. It's the purple hermit and it just has brilliant purple coloring and red legs with white spots. And it's just really brilliant looking when you're up close. And then there are just lots of cool fish that we see. So here on the top is a kelp greenling. I think the greenlings are generally one of my some of my favorite fish, they just have incredible coloration. Some of them have sexual dimorphism, so the males and females look different. The bottom is a juvenile sable fish. It's just an incredible blue color on the back, lots of different colors of blue. And, um, and there's this. And what, if you think you know what this is, I guess put it into the chat. Okay, so. If you think you know what this creature that's on this on the picture here is, um, type it in, and we'll see whether your identification is correct. I have to say that I've I have not seen one of these things before, so it's it's hard to tell what it is. Um, Pam is is guessing that it might be an eel. Any other guesses? I think that, oh, Kevin is asking if it's a greenling. It is not a greenling. All right, we give up. What is it, Sean? So this is a snailfish. So there are lots of different snailfish. They often have really ornate coloration. Um, and you can see here, 
you can see the eye, so it's the fins here, so it's a it's a fish, but it's very slimy. Um, it's really cool looking. And then I told you all that there would that I would um, come back to something at the end here. Um, but before we, we do, uh, or there was something to remember from the beginning. Um, so before we do, this is a deep sea fish called a mctophid. I'm wondering if people have guesses for what all of these little dots are along the, the edges of the body. And I'll give you a hint. It's called the lanternfish. So there's a bunch of small dots along the side of the fish. And what do you guys think that those are used for? Texas is asking, do they glow? And Sean did say it was a deep sea fish, so maybe it's bioluminescent. Yeah. Yes, Kevin is saying bioluminescent cells. Yep. Yeah, so those are photophores. They're bioluminescent. They're, they're bioluminescent uh, organs on, on this deep sea mctophid. And mctophids are a very, very common prey for these guys. If anyone can remember what these are, you can go ahead and put that in the, in the chat as well. So you might remember that picture down there as the bird that Sean started out studying when he just got out of college. And he said it's not going to be a test, but he did say that it would test. come up at the end. So we don't have any guesses so far. I do think it's a very pretty bird. All right. All right. We'll just put the name up there. So it's the leeches storm petrel. So mctophids are, are some of the most abundant fishes in the world's oceans, and they are one of the favorite prey items of food items for, for these storm petrels. And, and just so, as you had put up the name, Laura, Michelle, and Pam all put the name in. So they did get it. <laughs> all right. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's sort of my favorite part of going to sea is I just don't really know what I'm gonna what's gonna come in the next haul and there's always something fresh to see and it just sort of reminds me back of of uh, looking under rocks and in tide pools as a kid. So Texas actually had a question about that. How do the storm petrels get the lantern fish if they're in the deep sea? Yeah, so the storm petrels do not dive. They feed at the they feed at the surface. And the mctophids come up at night to feed on, on the plankton and the surface layers, and the storm petrels pick them off. All right. Well, we only have a few minutes left, so I think that we'll probably need to um, finish up here. But thank you so much, Sean, for sharing your pictures and your, your job with us. Um, I really appreciate the time that you've taken to talk to us about your work. And thank you to everybody for being on the line here with us and learning about um, fisheries and um, environmental monitoring. And next week, we are going to have some special guests from the Alaska Marine Science Symposium in Anchorage talking with us about their work. We will have Elizabeth Sidden and Mark Van Arsdale. And um, next week, just to give you a heads up, our webinar will be one hour later than it is today. So it'll be at noon Alaska time because it'll be at the at the symposium. So thank you again, Sean, and um, thanks to everybody on the line. Thank you all for attending.